This is the Besotted Pride of West London podcast. And we're coming to you from Nashville. At, oh, actually, no, sorry, I've got, I've got that wrong, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place now. We're coming to you from London. I'm back in the virtual joint, back in North London here with uh, my man Laney in uh, West London over there. How are you doing, Laney? Yes, I'm all right, mate. Yeah, not as jet lagged as you probably are. Um, I know where I am at least, uh, and yes. I know where I'll be at three o'clock on Saturday as well. I'll be, yes. I'll be back in the home of world football, mate. That's right, the world of the home of world football, and I've I've, I've been around the world watching football the last uh, the last few days. I mean, a few people have been reporting in, and a few characters know what I've been up to. But as you know, I decided to step out for a few days and went to go and watch the bees playing out of the country. The Bees are playing Brighton and also they played Aston Villa. And I went to Florida to go and visit my mum and my family, my brother over there. And uh, I saw the Brighton game over there. And I also saw the Aston Villa game in a place called Nashville, which I had no idea about, Laney. I never knew that Nashville was such a absolutely bonkers place. Um, I just went out there just on the off chance, pretty much, like you know. And uh, I knew, I heard there was a bit of a fan fest out there premier league fan fest which happens every year didn't know too much about it my brother was going there and i thought let me just step along with you and i stepped out into nashville and all i can say is mate it, it puts all, all the other places that we went to in america in the summer it puts them to shame because it is definitely an absolutely bonkers party city and uh and when i say bonkers literally bars music starts at 10 o'clock in the morning goes on all night people in the streets driving around in, in bands and you know girls in trucks and cowboy hats drinking loads of cowboy hats mate loads of cowboy boots i've never seen so many cowboy boots in all my life like you know but i've just never seen so much pottiness like you know it kind of reminded me of sort of newcastle big market you know with cowboy boots and sort of <laughs> and, and, and hats on like you know saying multiplied by 10 and and starting at 10 o'clock in the morning not like starting at six o'clock at night as it does in newcastle it literally is all day and uh, i mean let's, let's, I mean, this is how mad it is on Monday, I was getting my plane and I decided to just stop into town and do a little bit of catch up work. So I got into town, all of a sudden, this bar was open 10 o'clock in the morning. So I thought, let me just pop in the bar and I can sit there, have a cup of tea and everything like that. And I've gone in there, put that down. Next minute, ding, 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 music was playing at 10 o'clock in the morning in this bar. And I'm looking around me and it's completely full. Everyone's drinking and it was a work day. It wasn't even a holiday. It was a work day. <laughs> the place was packed, music. Then I looked down the street and every other bar was absolutely going on at 10 o'clock in the morning that's the kind of place that it is so, what, a, what a, ba a band playing or band was playing at 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> not only in that bar but in every single bar down the street as well it was absolutely bonkers you know what i'm saying and the place was packed i mean i sat in the roof garden so i was in the roof um sitting down there overlooking the whole of nashville and it was just honestly it was just i've just i've never seen anything like it it was just and and to them it's just just normal it's just completely and utterly normal they're going oh yeah going down broadway yeah that's just what happens like you know i'm just like this is bonkers like you know so uh it was it was good you know so, sounds, I mean, uh, keep... sounds sounds a lot more fun than wolves away mate well, well as the villa away even like you know what i'm saying yeah yeah um, yeah. Yes, yeah so you know just they're close to each other but yeah which is all good and uh like i said you're talking about it a little bit before i mean obviously there's a bit of a bees presence out there as well so gary blissett hung out with gary blissett marcus gale obviously paul buckles out there his wife um rebecca lowe who's the um uh, the, she's the gary lineker of, uh, of of American football out there. She's very, very famous. Everyone sort of knows her. So she was out there sort of presenting a live show with uh, the two Robbies, Robbie Earl and Robbie Musto, and also Tim Howard. I met them all as well. Quite mad. Mo Farah's out there. Had a, had a few words of Alan Shearer. Talked to him about sort of, uh, talked to him about um, France 98. Actually, he was quite stunned when I told him that I was, I was behind the goal when he, uh, when he went, went in France 98 for the, for the Tunisia game. He was just like, well, really? You know, so mm. chatted to him. Mo Farah's out there, which is quite random as well. Ledley King. I had a chat with him as well about um, about England because uh, I loved him when he played for England. He was uh, they got injured as well, but yeah, great. So mad. Daniel Sturridge was out there. Honestly, it was it was bonkers, mate. It was just like there's loads more characters out there as well, and it was just proper proper life. Fifteen thousand people over two days as well, just watching football on, on a big screen. So uh, you know, can't can't get better than that, as they say. No, that sounds really good, mate. Yeah, missed out on one there, but uh, um, I'm I'll go next year, assuming that we're in the Premier Division. 
<laughs> keeping up uh, listen there's no presumptions there mate you know <laughs> things are the things are going in the right direction as far as i'm concerned i'm actually I mean, we'll probably talk because we've, this has been a quite a long intro but we've just talked about it later but i actually managed not only the the aston villa game which was absolutely tremendous game watching that on the big screen um everyone was going mad sort of cheering brentford on i mean there's a photograph you see or a video with people like chelsea shirts and everything like that going mad when we scored our third goal i mean everyone was jumping up on top of each other i jumped to top of paul buckle you know gary plissett kind of like it's going really mad but then after that the following day i actually watched the tottenham nottingham forest game and i think for me that was even better because i watched it just right beside a load of nottingham forest fans and they were singing lots of songs about you know about european cups um particularly when they equalized but then of course when tottenham scored their second and third goal the tottenham fans retaliated and uh, it was quite a good feeling it has to be said because they were just they just went back right into their shell and you know and i was sitting down there sort of kind of chuckling and smiling i was there with one of the gowlers mates who's a forest fan and he's a really nice bloke but he was a forest fan and I, i couldn't you know i couldn't you know help sort of kind of smile to myself thinking you know mate you know it's not looking too good for you at the moment now and uh yeah so it's just one of those things though isn't it yeah it is um and <laughs> you know it's it it's one of them things and it's it's just it, it just unfortunately it, everything's still in the mix isn't it you know yeah. the, they, they win one and they lose and we're still drawing uh you know this it, i mean it does crystallize how important this saturday's game is now because yes. there's, there's, the games are running out now, aren't they? Um, yes. And the, the relegation zone is looking... It's, it, nothing really changed, but, you know, it's, it's narrowed a little bit. Um, we just need three points and we can sort of breathe a sigh of relief. But no. Sheffield That's... United is going to be a proper tricky game, mate. It is the big game. And it's the first time we've actually mentioned Sheffield United as well. And again, talking about Nashville, I watched the Sheffield United versus Chelsea game out there. And, and in a way, yeah, I, I was quite pleased because obviously Sheffield United scored a couple of goals and all the Chelsea fans who were there. It's quite funny because like what they did is that you know, you know, there's massive, massive crowd for the Liverpool Man United game, a like, huge crowd. And they're all singing, all the Man United fans and the Liverpool fans are all singing. But then a lot of them left and then in comes like the Chelsea fans. And then what they did is that the merchandise people came in and they gave out loads of merch because there's loads of merch being given out, like, you know what I'm saying, sort of balls hat so you're coming around and somebody's trying to give you like a a Bournemouth ball then a Newcastle kind of thing for put you on your wrist and then a Aston Villa something then a West Ham thing so I mean if if you wanted to you literally could have collected merch from every single team if you wanted to and I was like they're coming up to me to go to West Ham for no interest Fulham this are absolutely (laughs) no interest like you know what I'm saying Tottenham something or the other but then the Chelsea what happens Chelsea came in all these characters and then the Chelsea people just wheeled in and dished out loads of flags so there's like millions and millions of flags they sort of came to everyone so when they went on TV and Chelsea started playing. If they, when they beamed out to the crowd, all you could see was like these massive Chelsea fags. And to be fair, they did a good job. So all, all my Chelsea mates who, was, who had seen it were like going, oh, Chelsea's taken over. They've got loads of fans out there. So I'm like, well, they don't actually. What they've done is they've just done a good job to make the optics look really good, to look like they've actually kind of taken it over on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a major in a major way but it was actually quite funny when well, when Sheffield United scored their two goals because there was a lot of silence coming from from the West Londoners from the other West Londoners from Milwaukee and wherever else they'd come from so uh, Sheffield United I was quite pleased they got a result they'll probably talk about that later but and the other way I just thought actually maybe that's not a good thing for us because if they've got their tails up after getting a draw against Chelsea they might think they can get a result against us yeah, well, you know, they've beaten us already this season. So, um, you know, it, it's games like the ones against us at the moment. They'll they be looking at and thinking, um, you know, it's it's a chance to it's, it's a chance to get points. You know, we, yeah. we 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 can we can look at the the games we have played recently and we can pat ourselves on the back that we've made an improvement, but we haven't won. Um, so we're we're kind of still in it. And uh, you lose Saturday then the alarm bells seriously go off. You know, I think we've all made the presumption that, you know, that there's points to be had here. But we've we've seen football for long enough to know that we take that for granted. And if the players take it for granted, then you're looking at you're looking at coming unstuck. So, you know, um, I I'm 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 nervous, you know. I'm 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 excited because I think, you know, I've I've seen what my team can do in the re- in recent weeks and you know it's I, I'm confident that you know the players coming back and Brian um, starting and scoring goals now, and you know it, 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 things have improved for sure. But 
until we get those three points by hook or by crook, you know, even winning ugly, we might have to do that on Saturday. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be, it could be quite attritional at times. If we if we don't create and take our chances, it's going to be really nervous in the GTEC and uh, we're going we're gonna to need a lot of things to go our way. Um, we need Sheffield United to be the Sheffield United they were three or four weeks ago where they couldn't defend for Toffee, you know. Um, yeah. And we need a couple of other results to go our way as well elsewhere. So, you know, I, you know again, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm still very much glass half full. But, you know, we've, we've seen quite often that, you know, you, 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 count the, the points already before you've played the game and uh, it doesn't always work out that way. No, definitely not. So listen, we've got loads of other stuff that we want to talk about on this podcast as well. Just just quickly, just talking about, um, I mean, things not quite working out, but the fact is that looking forward to next season, because obviously we'll talk about it a little bit later, obviously Ivan Tony played against Aston Villa. He was on the bench for the first time and we'll talk about that say a little bit later, but he, you know, he, it's almost like we're, we're getting in preparation for him to leave the club. And, and we bought a, a, a player who... People are saying he's his replacement because we've we've now we've played sort of thirty odd million pounds for this player. Whether or not he is his replacement, or whether or not he's just another player who we've actually just bought to actually fill the gap, we shall see. Um, Thiago, um, but there's it, it doesn't seem to be going particularly well with Thiago since he signed the deal with Brentford. It's almost like he's taken the eye off the Belgian ball, isn't it, Laney? Because uh, before he signed with us, he was scoring goals for fun. But as soon as he signed for the Bees, he signs for the Bees uh, from, from Bruges. I think he's at Bruges at the moment now um we decided to leave him on loan at Bruges until the end of the season because they wanted to get Champions League football or something I don't know what it was but yeah we kept him there he said there you go mate just stay in Bruges and then since then he's 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 completely fluffed it, isn't he he, is, he hasn't can't score a goal for Toffee can he Laney no he, 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 he doesn't seem to have uh, been like very popular with the Bruges fans and with the the Belgian press um there was a there was an article yesterday in um belgian football uh website um and it quoted uh you know the the great the great footballer that is thomas rosinski that played a few games for fulham um and he was he was quite scathing of um of tiago he's you know basically i'm paraphrasing now he's you know he, even even during his good period early in the season he looks a clumsy striker um he's also not a real target man um in his kind of, this is the quote that you can sell someone with so many flaws for so much money. Congratulations. So, you know, whether he's put his Fulham hat on and he's kind of just dissing, um, you know, Brentford, but you know, this is it's rattled a few bees fans, the, the kind of the usual suspects, kind of blaming, you know, looking for a reason to kind of uh slag a player off before he's even arrived in the country but um some people said oh is it, can we can we get out of this deal i mean i don't i don't think you get out of a deal because you know fulham rejects um you know, a lower league belgian manager kind of slate someone um but you know we we know that the the, the metrics that he's been judged um and we've paid a, an incredible amount of money out for is not necessarily based on his goal scoring you know, one of the most kind of head scratchy, stroke and lightning conversations I've had with you in the presence of was with Matt Benham um, when he said um, over a beer that goal scoring is this, is not the first thing he looks at when he when he looks when he looks to buy a striker. Um, the, 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 and we're like, what? And is it, 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 they say, they see things so differently. You know, it's 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 about. Our system, it's, a, it's the, the chances that we know we'll create for them, not the ones that is being created for at the moment. Yeah, of course, you know, ability and strength and, you know, is, 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 is the way he finishes. That's all important, but it's not the most important. It's kind of like we've been, he's going to be airdropped into Brentford and he's, it's like one of those things like, you imagine, yeah, he's good, but you imagine how good he could be for us. In the same way that probably a lot of t a lot of clubs are looking at Ivan Tony. Oh God, it is incredible for Brentford. You imagine what he would he would do here. You know, imagine what Ivan Tony would do at Man City. Imagine how many goals he would score there. Imagine what he would do at Liverpool. Imagine how many goals he'd score there. And the old proverbial, you know, the one that goes round and round. You imagine what he would do in an Arsenal team. So it, it's it's that. 
it's, it's that all comes into it. So yeah, I know we've paid we've paid a lot of money. Um, we are not used to our club paying that amount of money, but uh, you know it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's like if you don't if you don't stop up in the amount you pay, you don't get an improvement in Premier League ready players, um, and then they get. You know, they get um, accused of not being ambitious enough and having crap transfer windows. We've already got in uh, our, our, our Ivan Tony replacement. Ivan Tony's, you know, is, there's every chance he might still be here uh, next season. But bloody unlikely. But you know, at the, until he, until he's gone, he's, he's ours. Yeah. So um, uh, I, this, it's going to be a huge summer and a huge summer of you know we need that that can't be the last player we buy. We, it's clear that with injuries uh, we need to strengthen elsewhere as well, but uh, to have to have one in the bag, it, it, it does take a certain amount of pressure off, and um, we're going to have to we're going to have to kind of give him the benefit of the doubt and um, allow him to integrate into English life and um, a new way of playing football. Bill. Yeah, so no pressure on him then when he comes over at all. Then later, oh, it's a massive, massive amount of pressure. Of course, it's pressure. Yeah, and that's what you want. You want big. You, you want you want him to be excited and nervous about coming into a team. You know, you 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 want to feed off of that ad- adrenaline that hopefully he's got. You know, if he has taken his foot off the gas there, then you know, so be it. I mean, you know, that, that he obviously doesn't want to get injured. It's going to be like his life will be transformed by coming to England. Yeah, it's 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 the biggest move he'll ever make. You know, well, the biggest move he's ever made. Um, and this is this is life changing. This is like generational wealth changing amount of money that he's going to get to come here. So um, yeah, if he's taking it seriously, then 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 that's great. That's good indeed. So, I mean, we're talking about a player coming in. We're also going to be talking about a player who is leaving on the outdoor. And let's be Stuart Dallas, who scored a fabulous goal against Fulham when we absolutely smashed them at Craven Cottage. We put four goals past them in our first season back in the Championship. The bees up, Fulham down, yeah, when Bracey Brentford went up from the third tier and Fulham came down from the for the top tier and it was proper full on bees up full and down the fact we'd been singing that song for the previous 14 years and then it just came to sort of fruition that bees that went up and Fulham came down and then we played them and then we smashed them twice in one season you couldn't get a better season than that so uh Ooh. yeah but Stuart Stuart Dallas brilliant goal the whole history of Dallas you know coming over two from, goals scored two yeah, goals that's right that's right sorry yeah two two goals I'll take it of the one in particular that he scored was a great goal um but also just thinking about his you know his whole history him coming over from Ireland you know him coming there and, and at that time when again Matthew Benham was using his kind of like we buy these players and they come from you know from, from rough diamonds as they are you've never heard of them but we're going to make them decent players and you know he came from Ireland for about a million pounds if I remember rightly uh and he came over yes you know, like I said started off as a winger for us and uh he was good he did some really really you know great player um and and, and we saw him kind of grow as a player but then I don't know in the end he left us and the feeling that I had is that you know when he left us we kind of felt that he was um he we, he'd outgrown not out, he'd outgrown us but we we could probably get better I think is what we thought at the time and 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 he left and he ended up going to to Leeds United and to be fair to Leeds United he actually kind of grew into a, like a really important player um moved back a couple of couple of couple of lanes and <laughs> moved back into defense became a bit of a fullback and uh, yeah and he and he went from strength to strength didn't he yeah, he, he he did. Um, you know, he, he was he was really a, a really exciting prospect. You know, he came came from Crusaders in Northern Ireland, and we we had him for a bit, and he, we sent him out on loan to Northampton for a little bit, um, and he came back stronger. And as you know, he was part of that uh, great first season in the Championship when we got to the playoffs, and you know, unfortunately lost up at Middlesbrough, um, and then. Yeah, he got he got his chance to to go to to Leeds um, at the follow. It was following. I, I'm sure I've got the timeline right. I'm sure he left that that summer that we didn't go up in the playoffs, and um, uh, he, he, he moved to Leeds. And then I I don't I mean I'm not, I don't want to play on this too much, but I mean the the old elephant in the room is you know that Stuart Dallas. Um, uh, you know, he, he was part of that. You know, mind the gap, Thomas Frank song, where on the day that Leeds got 
got promoted to the Premier League. He was, you know, he was caught on video kind of singing anti Brentford, anti Thomas Frank songs. So that with, kind of with that, the trophy, with, with the trophy, with the as trophy, well. yeah. yeah. Odd, odd behaviour, you know. One of our crew said, you know, strange that on the biggest day of his his life to that stage, he's he's holding the trophy, slagging off his previous club. You know, I I, I don't. I think that was just like it's really it was really outrageous and I don't know if it was really odd and unless there really was beef but you know leaving Brentford for Leeds I would have thought that was you know a big big salary hike and a, and a, and a really good move for him so I don't I don't think there could have been beef but maybe he just got carried away no there was beef there was beef because all during the season I think but basically what it was is that Thomas Frank um, says it as it is and what he does is he says it, you know he gives us um, statistical analysis so if he plays a team and he'll say something like you know um, like we might have played Leeds and we might have, I mean we might have been better for them and he just says you know you know he'll, he'll say it as it is and Again, certain fans will just take it with a pinch of salt, but you know, at least United fans, they just take it really, really seriously. So I think there was a scenario where there was a bit of beef between us and Thomas Frank and Lees. And also we had the scenario when he was the assistant to Dean Smith. And uh, there was a scenario when we were beating them 1-0, if you remember rightly. And then that's the one when Sergi Canos headbutted one of their players and he was in the dugout. And then the ball came over to Thomas Frank, who was the assistant. And then he kept hold of the ball and he just wouldn't give it back to them. And they got really, really annoyed. And then Pontus Janssen came in and scored an equalising goal in the sort of kind of dying minutes of the game to, to make it one all. So there's always been this kind of beef thing going between Lees and Thomas Frank. And also the other thing is, and I know this for a fact, Thomas Frank doesn't need anything to kind of G him up when he plays Leeds because him, uh, Leeds are one of the teams that winds him up absolutely the most. And I think the, the, the reason why, maybe because of the fans, maybe what's happened on the bench, there's certain things most definitely, they're definitely one of the teams. So there's definitely a bit of history and a bit of beef. And I think in the end, when Leeds went up, got automatically promoted and we got resigned to the playoffs that year. For them, that was one sort of kind of stick two fingers up at you. There you go, mate. So you, you can give us as much stats as you want. You can say what you want about us. You can say you're better than us, but we've beaten you. And that's uh, that's 100% where all that came from. Yeah, no, I know the I know the Leeds beef, but I, I, it's him. You know, I don't know what his his beef with, with Brentford would have been. I, and I know, you know, you get, yeah, anyway, I think, you know. I, but he's at Leeds. Yeah, I, I know. But I thought I thought that was just, you know, it, it, I thought that would, you know, would it was a bit out of order, but well, more than a bit out of order. Yes, um, it was well, it was bag out of order. It was, it was, it was not. Well, as it was I not, said, yeah, more, more than a bit out of order, bang out of order. But you know, so any no manners. Anyway, so he's, you know, he's he got he got a really bad injury, uh, 2022 um, against Man City. I think I think he was uh, he tried to foul someone and he ended up busting his knee badly and it's irre- irreparable. So um, you know, it was sad to see um, you know a career come to an end um especially when you know he played a really good part in Brentford's rise from league one into the championship and it was a real stepping stone for him so yeah I mean apart from we park the beef for the moment between us and him um and obviously you know we wish him well for the future we do the manners we'll keep it classy and um I hope hope he's got a really good future in the game somewhere and um yeah wish him wish him well yeah, wish him well. And, and to be fair as well, he did release a statement as well today, or was it yesterday? And the, the statement that he released yesterday, and he actually mentioned Brentford in there, and he and he talked about Brentford as being part, you know, of his rise, and you know, couldn't be a better club that you know he could start off his career with as well. So he did the manners with the Brentford, and and, we, and like I said to you, and listen, we have to mention it because elephant in the room, because we'll probably never talk about it again. Maybe you know he's looked back and just thought, actually, to be quite honest with you, that's a bit silly of me what I did there. I was caught at the moment at the time. Yeah, there was a bit of beef going on, but at the end of the day, you know, what we've done is really good. And at the end of the day, I suppose, maybe the fact that, you know, we're still in the Premier League and they got relegated, he's actually just realised the bigger picture is kind of like, you know, it isn't about that little 10 minutes. It's about kind of the bigger picture. So, you know, you get older, as they say, when you're younger, you do silly things sometimes. And maybe it's a silly thing that he did after having a, a couple of couple of, couple, couple of whiskeys, like, you know, as a good lady he says, tucked into view whiskeys, like, you know, did a, uh, to Stuart Dallas, but which is all good. But anyway, listen, good luck with him. I'm sure that he's going to go uh, and go into coaching and have a have a marvelous coaching career. And he's going to be showing all the people that he's coaching, all the free kicks and the and the goals that he scored back in the day. So uh, anyway, but listen, talk about scoring goals back in the day. 
let's go back in the day to to Saturday. Um, let's go back to well, lady will go back to the UK. I'll go back to the, the USA, the Nashville, because those were the goals. We saw the goals going in to the back of the net. There were plenty of goals as well back in that day. We're going to go and have a little drink. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about that Aston Villa game. So Saturday, we went to Aston Villa. Nice day on Saturday as well, both in this part of the world, from what I can believe, looking at it on the TV, and also in where I was, in Nashville. And uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about and I'm going to say about that game is Brentford, when they're on it, they're on it, OK? And I think this is a really important thing to to, to take on board. You know, you might think, oh, what's he talking about? It's not just he's talking nonsense or it's not rocket science, is it? But it's not. It's actually really important because when we're talking about the position that we're in at the moment now and the position that we're in where, you know, some people think, oh, relegation trouble. Oh, we're not any good or a terrible side. The fact is that when we're on it, when we when we notch it up a gear, mate, we are on it. And that game was 100 percent a game of two halves. You know what I'm saying? First game. We, we wouldn't say we weren't in the game, but, you know, we were a little bit limp. We were a lot, we just, just, you know, Villa first, the ball, you could see that they were kind of moving it around and they were going to cause us a little bit of damage. They got them goals, the first goal, very frustrating. Second goal, just after half time, we weren't, we weren't in it. You know what I'm saying? And then we just went bang. And when we went bang, Villa were, I mean, not, not funny, they were properly on the back foot, properly, like they were booping their pants you know what I'm saying and we were just we just like honestly it, it looked like I mean we, we got three goals in the end in nine minutes we could have got about eight it looked like because we were just like every time we we're going forward you felt that and I just thought this is a really positive sign because the fact is that we know how good we are as a team when we're really on it and you could kind of see sparks of that coming back Brian and Bumo I mean I thought he was fabulous you know um Wisa I thought he was fabulous. They were just terrorising. They were causing problems all the time when they were going forward, you know. Interestingly, Ivan Tony wasn't in the side because he was on the bench and he came on a little bit later and it was almost like, oh, Ivan Tony's coming on. Do, do we really need him? It was like a bit of a weird scenario. But for me, I'm just sort of thinking, I, you know, I've always said this, but before, you know, previous seasons, even when we were in the championship, you, you've got to kind of come good at the right time. And the things have got to happen at the right time. You can have your, everyone has a little, every team has a little bit of a lull, a little bit of a bad period. And for me, when I saw how we were in that second half, and also we've had other games like the Man United game, and that we, yeah, we haven't got the results we're going to get. But any other team that's watching us thinking, mate, I don't want to play them because look at them, because you know at any stage they can do that. And we, Aston Villa, there's a, you know, there's a couple of Aston Villa fans in the crowd. There weren't that many, actually, because they were outnumbered. Uh, like I said to you in Nashville, probably there's about 40, 45 Brentford fans in the crowd, probably about 50, maybe even like that. And there's probably about five or six Aston Villa fans. And they just turned around and said, mate, hands up. You should have absolutely smashed us off the park in that game. We've got no complaints about that. And we were so happy to get a point. And for me, you take that into that next game, because that, for me, is the important thing. Your thoughts, Laney? Um, my thoughts. So I agree with part of that. I thought I thought we looked good when, um, obviously, when we scored all the goals. I, I thought we looked okay up until conceding the first goal. Um, the goal, their goal. Again, once again, we 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 did the low block. We defended really well, very very well structured. Uh, but there's always kind of a lapse, or not even if it's not necessarily a lapse, we're susceptible to that curling in. in you know, that cross that comes in. Um, and after that, you know, after going 2 0 down, you kind of obviously you fear the worst. Now, I kind of I do agree when we're on it, we're on it. And I also would say that never write us off um, because this team have clearly got an incredible spirit. Uh, I, I would say. We were on it for not long enough in that second period. Once we got the third goal, Villa came back into it and you could kind of see an equaliser coming. And if the game was another 10 minutes longer, um, then I think that Aston Villa probably might win it. So, yeah, there was, there are positives to be taken out of it and, and um, encouragement for the games ahead. But we need to be on it for you know, from the first minute to the last, like we were against Man United, um, but get our rewards. That seems to have evaded us. I don't I don't know what it is. That that luck's gonna break, I think. 
you hope it was. It has to. You know, you can't play really well and and not win a game for for you know for the rest of the season. But we have to we have to blitz Sheffield United. We have to put in the performance that they can't cope with, and that nine minutes has to be you know ninety minutes. Or if it's not ninety minutes, it's seventy five minutes, and we have to create and convert chances. So yeah, I I take a lot out of the Villa game because at 2-0 down I'm not thinking there's anything to be taken out of this and then all of a sudden it shows you what an incredible game football is you, you can be bouncing around and, and you know celebrating three you know cracking goals coming in you know Brian Abumo's goal and you know it was, was, was just incredible I mean Zanka's goal um, I'm not even sure he knew what he was doing there but they all go in um, and then uh, you know Wiesa uh, was with it, the ball from the ball that was was played in um, from Regulon was was just stunning. You know, I thought I think Regulon played his best game for us, um, and you know there 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 were there were big plus points from that in the second half and from the beginning. You know the the, the way we defend. So um, yeah. But it's all right to be doing low blocks, and you can't. But you can't concede. Yeah, you, you have to then hit on the break and, and score. But we had to do that from three two, uh, from sorry, from two nil down. And I think we'll find out from JB a little bit later how rare it is that you know we think we, we go on to score three. So it's all for me. Well done. But it's, it Saturday's is the biggest game I think this season so far. Yeah, we've been, I mean, we've, saying, we've been saying that all the time. Of course, Saturday's the biggest game. And, and also the other thing is that we know that defensively we've got issues because we haven't got the defence that we normally have. So it's always going to be an issue. But my, 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 yeah. my, problem, my, my, my whole thing is, and that's why I'm saying being positive about it, there's some teams who would have a defence like that, but they can't score. We can score, OK? You've got t- teams in, 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 in relegation uh, problems who can't score for Toffee, right? The fact is, yeah, we've got defensive issues, but that's because we've got, and this is all due respect to him, we've got Zanka in defence, you know what I'm saying? And he's cool, but sometimes, like, the ball comes across, like, come on, Zanka, put your head on it. Oh, no, it's gone in the back of the net. You know, you've got Fle- Flecken coming out there for a cross. Oh, no, he's missed it. Oh, it's in the back of the net. So we've got issues there, which we know about, but we can score. And trust me, if you can score goals, you've always got a chance. So listen, these next few games coming up are going to be very, very exciting. And like I said to you, it might be a game that we just don't expect to win that we pull one out of the bag. We might go home, and I want to say it, on Saturday, very, very sad. But then maybe one or two weeks later, we come out and go, oh, no, we got a result. But we didn't expect it to, so which is all good. But listen, I mean, we're getting excited talking about the game. But I'll tell you what we should do. We should go back and listen to what the fans had to say. We're going to go to Nashville because we did the post-match podcast from the Fan Fest in Nashville. Let's hear what the all the American fans and uh, and a couple of English as well had to say. We've got Gary Blissett. We've got a few other characters, what they said to say immediately after the Aston Villa game. We've got a team that is fighting all the way. And that's what we expect as Brentford fans. We want the players to keep fighting. To score three goals in the second half, we expect to win that game as well. But what a performance in that second half. But the boys, what a great shift in today. So proud of how they all played. Brilliant experience out here in Nashville. And, you know, I wish we could just hang on to things a little bit longer. I wanted that goal to be in the 88th and not in the 68th. Because we knew Villa had come back at us. But credit to the players. We've shown the last three games that we're in this fight and we're going to fight all the way till the end. We'll nick points, we'll win points, and brave performances like today will keep go- keep us in good stead. Oh my God, I thought I thought it was over at halftime. I did not think after um, after uh, the second half started and they went up 2-0, I didn't think we had a chance there for a bit. But um, at the end there, I'll take it for after that. We got uh, Sheffield and... Uh, to next. Let's get six points. Get away from the relegation. 2-0 down. I was pretty disappointed at the moment. Especially when they first scored the first minute coming out of halftime. But we, Bueno played great. Wisa was playing great. Yes, they did. It was an amazing goal. It was just wonderful to see. Honestly, after they scored two, I was not sure if we would be able to come back. But I'm so glad we came back. That's exactly right. So the Men United match was my first match at the GTEC, And it was epic. Incredible to be at the Globe with all, with all the supporters, with you, etc. And then I was there on Wednesday night as well for Brighton. I flew back to Atlanta Thursday night, got in my car, drove to Nashville yesterday afternoon. And now here we are all together again watching that incredible match. Interesting thing about our club 
There is never any quit in those players. They go, they go until the very end. And that's not something, that's not a skill thing, that's not an ability thing. That's about commitment, about passion, about dedication, and about heart, all those intangibles. And we always have those in buckets. Even when we don't necessarily play our best, we're always going until the very, very end. And yeah, we were up 3-2. Villa equalized. Watkins, two goals. Urgh. However, big picture, I think that if you would have asked all of us early this morning, going to Villa, would we be happy with a 3-3 draw? I think we would all have been, would have been very happy with a 3-3 draw. So, But the big one is next weekend, and today didn't change that. I think a question in everybody's mind, are we going to be you know, the team that was against United or the team that's going to be that just went against Brighton? And I think they came out, they, they did a fantastic job uh, you know, coming back from the deficit of uh, two to, you know, uh, going ahead and then unfortunately getting the uh, draw. But I think it was a, <laughs> I think it was a fantastic game. Uh, you know, all the players fought and... Uh, I was very nervous. We weren't playing the best. But, uh, after they scored the first goal, uh, I felt like we had all the momentum. What a game. I was hoping we were going to pull it out, but one point's one point, right? Tight. Three goals in 10 minutes. Yeah. That was so amazing. You know, coming out at uh, halftime and giving up a quick goal was uh, kind of gutted after that. But um, the fight in this team, they just, they never give up. Um, you know, it wasn't our uh, ideal lineup uh, today. But, um, you know, we, uh, they just, they never give up, and I'm proud of the boys. Uh, it was amazing to be down by two, two goals and to come back like that. I mean, it's disappointing to give, give away a late goal like that, and I was worried about possibly giving up a late winner, but one, but one point from Aston Villa on the road, uh, I think I would take that all day. And, uh, you know, just lots of really good performances. Regalon had a, a, had a massive game. Uh, uh, Wisa, again, Mbembe, I mean, you know, you name it. The fact that we were playing without Ivan Tony and, uh, and we played so well, I mean, it makes me really feel com somewhat more com confident going down, down uh, for the rest of the season. Uh, I think that we're going to stay up. There's, there's, uh, to me, there's no doubt about that. And uh, we just need to keep on, keep on keeping on. So there you go, fans, straight after the Villa game. And like I said to you, Bees legends, Gary Blissett in there. You've got Marcus Gale. You know, he was actually Marcus Gale, Gary Blissett and Robbie, Robbie Earl. Right, okay, the crazy game reunited as well. Got a photograph of them all together as well. And obviously Paul Buckle was there from the old 1992 legend side as well. That got promoted from the third tier to the second tier. So they were all out there as well. Good to see them as well. I want to give a shout out to Joanne and uh, Megan for taking good care of us as well. You know, we were down the brewery on Saturday night. Lots more free beers as well. And also to Patrick from the Visit Tampa Bay as well. Thanks very much for taking good care of us. All the bees out there got well and truly oiled as well on the, on the Tennessee brewery. Which is uh, which is quite good as well. And I said to you, Nashville B as well. Thank you. Got to give you a shout for putting us up as well. The Nashville B, Kevin, and Reggie as well. The Tallahassee B and the Milwaukee B. Got her. <laughs> she's just mad. Milwaukee B. She's brilliant. And then there's also some guy I can't remember his name. He'd only been supporting Bread for 15. I think you might hear it on the package as well. Literally, he'd been supporting Bread for about 15 minutes. They they met him in the hotel. They said, like, who, who do you support? He goes, I've got no idea. They said, support Brentford. He goes, all right then. And the next minute he's coming out, he's got shirts on, he's got scarves, and he's like fully, fully, fully into it. So uh, some people might say it's all a bit touristy, but to be quite honest with you, you've got to get into your football team somehow. So I just thought it was quite hilarious when literally character supporting them for 15 minutes. Then first game was the Aston Villa game, real. And he was like, which is all good. But you can hear the fans there were properly, properly, um, you know, just, you know, probably on a high, I'd say. Um, after that match and uh, uh, the, the one thing you would say because obviously we talked about we're going to talk about Sheffield United a little bit later the one thing that you don't want is fans and the team being on a high going into a game like that and that Aston Villa game it could have gone really really quite horribly wrong especially after the Brighton game which was uh, which was so 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 flat that Brighton game I mean we, we like I said to you I, you know, I felt that we you know we just didn't want to win we didn't try and win. We didn't try it, but we didn't want to lose. And I thought we did a really brilliant job of not losing that Brighton game, but it kind of got us on a flatness. So coming out of this game now, we're on a high. 
I personally think that, 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 that it's just a massive plus for us going into this game. Um, any any players out there? I mean, you, I mean, you talked about Regulon, who had I thought had a great match. You know, what I'm saying, you know, setting up them goals, you know, going forward, causing problems. Anybody else in that game who you thought, okay, tell you something, I'm going to tip my hat to you. Well, yeah, I mean, you you, can, you have to, you, you can't, you can't not, you know, mention Brian and Bumo. He 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 made us, you know, he made us look like quality every time he got on the ball you know he holds it up well um and he gives gives two or three defenders a, you know a fright every time he runs at them um we saw again um i thought i thought he had a you know he thought he had a decent game um i thought Aya, he was he was decent um i, I thought um dam's guard he, he he you know he, he started he, he came on against brighton and he, he looked he was up to the speed of the uh the game straight away uh and it, so often he looks weak but he's looked he's looked pretty strong actually the last last couple of times i've seen him now um yeah there, there were positives but it's, it's just kind of as i keep going i'm not going to go back and, and, and say it all over again but they, they we were we were really good when we were really good and apart from that we were you know we were we looked solid um but we looked we still looked susceptible um, to, to letting in goals, you know, Flecken was a was a you know he flapped at that one, um, and you know we, we do look static sometimes when that ball comes over um, curled in, you know, curling in corners or curling in crosses, uh, we we don't know how to deal with them, um, you know, and I, it, it's something that we are going to have to deal with because Sheffield United are going to know that Everton following week they're going to know that Everton's the game where if we if we don't get our aerial um you know strength right if our goalkeeper is in caught in between two minds Everton are going to feed off that it's that's that's a it's a massive massive game so uh yeah <laughs> um it, there, there, there were other good performances uh, apart from Regulon but you know we need we need more from all of them yeah, definitely. So, uh, listen, okay, so look, we're going to go over to JB because JB is going to give us a few facts and some funk. Uh, let's, let's go to JB and see what he's got to say. Are you ready for this? I told you it was coming. Who? JB. And he's ready to talk it to you one time. Uh, get it. Hello, Jonathan Birchall back again. 19 teams we play in the Premier League this season. We have recorded away league wins against all those clubs in our history, apart from Villa, where we now have six draws and three defeats on our trips there. In our league history, if we are 1-0 down at half-time in an away league game, 75% of those games have gone on to end in defeat, 18% in draws and only 7% in wins. For us to score three in the second half from 1-0 down away at half-time has only happened in 3% of games. The Villa game was only in the second time in our history we've been 1 0 down away at half time, and the game finished 3 3. The other was at Orient in 1982, when Tony Mahoney, Gary Roberts, and Bob Booker were our scorers. We scored our three goals in a nine minute spell, just a minute quicker than three we scored in the 4 1 win at Chelsea in the first week of April two years ago. It was our final game against the side in the top four, and the only point we've taken off any of them this season. It's the first time we've now had three successive draws in the top tier, since the only other occasion we've had such a run back in January 1937. As it stands, Wisser and Mbumo are our joint top scorers with eight goals each, with just six games to play. There's only been six of our previous 96 seasons, where no one has reached double figures. We've already beaten the lowest, which was in the 46 game season of 8081 which had a mid-table finish in the third tier, when Bob Booker was our sole top scorer with just seven goals. Even more remarkable was that he scored four of them in the final six games of the season. There you go, JB, with some facts and some funk. And uh, like I said, a bit of a rarity. JB's talking about, you know, uh, I was just coming back from... those losing positions, as they say, uh, which is all good. But listen, um, lady, I mean... We talked about JB. Let's just go over to the Gowler. Okay, I saw the Gowler as well. He was obviously in Nashville. And uh, 
he was sitting down there watching a game on the big screen together and then he's sitting down there he got his computer out and he got his stats and his facts and he thought he's going to give us the lowdown the statistical lowdown and also the tactical lowdown on that villa match which will be very interesting and also looking forward to what we can expect from sheffield united Hey, this is Jacob Gallo with B's Breakdown. Uh, so Austin Villa ended with 70% possession, but Brentford won the XG battle. Uh, B's fans enjoyed some clinical finishing. Uh, the B's ended with 2.24 expected goals on target on only 1.56 XG. And Brentford surprisingly created most of their XG from open play, although they still use set plays to get numbers forward. And I thought that Villa did well to use clever movement to create some chances going forward. Uh, Brentford allowed some penetrating passes that typically you don't see uh, with their compact defense. And a lot of this had to do with Villa's movement and especially their blocking. Uh, Villa routinely set like basketball style screens to prevent Roslev from preventing crosses into the box. Uh, but the bees also are still having some momentary lapses on defense, particularly defending crosses. Still a much needed point for the bees against one of the top teams in the Premier League at the moment. All right, so for that Sheffield United preview, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that they've only kept one clean sheet all season, but the bad news is that that match was against the Bees back in December. So Sheffield are bottom of the table on 16 points. They're technically overperforming their XG with 30 goals on 29 XG, but they've conceded 82 goals only on 60 XGA. And for reference, last season, Leeds conceded the most goals in the league with 78. So by the end of the season, Sheffield may actually top Derby's record of 89 goals conceded in a Premier League season. Sheffield also have the worst pass completion percentage and the highest percentage of long passes attempted. They're pretty much last in every passing and possession statistic except for the percentage of goal kicks launched. Uh, they also have the second highest PPDA, which just backs up that they're not a high pressing team. They're going to consistently drop into that low block and allow the other team possession. However, over the past three matches, they've created more XG than they've allowed and they've gotten two draws in that time. So the bees need to be careful not to give Sheffield their second clean sheet of the season. So they go the Gala live and direct from Nashville, giving us a lowdown, statistical and tactical lowdown on the Villa game. And looking forward to the Sheffield game. And just quickly, Aston Villa, they were effective at creating goal scoring opportunities from the flanks and also were strong at finishing, but they gave away a lot of free kicks around the box. As for Brentford, we were effective at creating goal scoring opportunities from the flanks and also we were strong at finishing. We lost possession often, we were caught offside often, and we also committed a high number of individual errors. Top performers, according to whoscored.com, was Ollie Watkins, 8.5, it was pretty high. Uh, then Johan Wiesa and Sergio Regulon as well, two top, next two top scorers. And it was McGinn and it was Rogers. So that just kind of gives you a vibe about that game. So, I mean, to me, that's a good base for us to look at going into the Sheffield United game. Tell you what we're going to do, though. We're going to have to talk about the Sheffield United game because it's a big match. We're going to uh, take a little break. We're going to come back and then we're going to talk about the Blades. We've just come down off the high of the weekend, chilling out for a few days and then we're back in it again saturday out very early we've got the blades coming down mark and reg are coming down you probably heard talk about a lot go to england with them but they're coming down very early actually coming down on friday they're so excited and then we're going out early we're gonna hit the town for them it's their bit of their last send-off because they believe that they're not going to come back to brentford for quite a while for us it's just a bit of a party you know we've got to get ourselves fired up for this game on saturday we're hoping that everyone's going to get themselves out early and get themselves in the mode because we really need to get behind that team a hundred percent but the blades coming down i mean we went up to sheffield great away day what i'll say we'd always brag about that away day saying it's a fantastic away day however on the pitch it didn't go according to plan it was a bit rubbish on the pitch we cannot repeat that at all can we laney no, we can't. Um, it was it was one of the flattest kind of well bereft of uh, like options that Thomas Frank has has been able to call upon. It seemed to be that just before Christmas that you know we just lost Brian and Bumo, 
Um, it was the game after Brighton. We lost that one. And then we thought, although we weakened, we, we still stood a chance. And we, we did have a couple of opportunities, you know. I think um, Wiesa should have scored. Um, but it, 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 was a, it was probably the one of the low points. And that's not to diss Sheffield United, because, you know, as you said, we've got a lot of time. We've got a lot of history between the two clubs. We, we've sort of been up and down together. Um, and they're, you know, they're a, they're they're a very big, proud club, and um, we, you know, I've got some great memories of going there and some great great games. Um, but that that certainly wasn't one of them um, up at Bramall Lane, and we came away kind of thinking, right, okay, it, it's going to be that kind of rest of the season, isn't it? Uh, we thought we would escape, you know, when when um, Ivan Tony was was absent. But you, then you, then once you took Brian and Boomer out of that as well, and obviously Rico Henry, and then that's, it's when all the all the injuries started to pile one on top of the other, um, and it, it, it was a desperate afternoon. So we need to put that right. Um, things are improving for us in terms of the 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 players that we've got at our disposal and I'm hearing that there may be more you know there was you know Sharda um, it was 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 I think he might be available this weekend you know whether it's just on the bench in the same way that we fed Brian and Bumo back in but I think I think we start with with Brian and Tony on, on Saturday um, we have to go all guns blazing and we've you and I have said this for weeks Bill haven't we it's it's if we could kind of coincide all of our players to be available it's for this game we always knew that this game was going to be critical three points you know are so rare at the, at, down at the bottom at the moment that you know each one is it, it transforms the look um six games to go now is there's own there's you know we saw so we go to we got Sheffield United this weekend then we go to Luton the following weekend then we've got Everton three games Two, sorry, two, two, three games. Two of the next three, three games. Three teams below us, um, and then obviously we've got Fulham, who you're not quite sure which one you're going to get. So there's points to be had out of our next four games. We have to be really, really confident out of that. And if we don't get them, then then I start to worry. But it's 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 not something that I'm losing sleep over. I've got every faith that Brentford are going to get what they need um, from the rest of the season. And it starts It starts on Saturday. It's, it's very much like the Nottingham Forest game. We know that there's more to it than than just the three points or, or, or the team in front of us. It, it, it's going to shape the rest of the season. It's going to shape um, you know, our survival. And it's interesting. I mean, you said uh, start with Brian Tony, I mean, Ivan Tony, And obviously Ivan Tony didn't start... On Saturday, because of the injury that he's got, he's got a hip injury, so he came on. Um, but you're thinking that you should start with him. I mean, you know, so you, you're not thinking that the the Wiesa um, and Boomer combination did all right on Saturday, and you wouldn't continue with that? No, no, absolutely not. No, uh, it has it has done all right, but you know, the, there was a couple of the crosses that went in, um, and you think if Ivan's there, then that that's that's a headed goal. You know, or Ivan can sniff. A, he's too good. To, to not have um, in, in, in our team. And I, I understand some fans have kind of been, um, you know, haven't been as impressed by him since, he, he, you know, in the more recent weeks than they, you know, he's, he's clearly, you know, not at his best. But I think he's he's such a predatory striker. I think he brings so much. Well, I, we know what he brings to our game. We need him against Sheffield United. We we need all our best players on that pitch, Bill. I, I think boxing clever. Uh, I, I don't. I, I think you're asking for trouble. I, think, I really do. Well, okay, so listen. I mean, talk about in trouble. <laughs> we got Mark from Sheffield. He's going to be coming down for the weekend to watch the bees play against him. So uh, I'm going to have a little chat with Mark uh, from Sheffield. Mark the Blade. Uh, he's going to give us the lowdown on Sheffield United. So big game on Saturday. Looking forward to it, actually. Been, you, know, you know me. I've been looking forward to this game for absolutely ages. It's been the one game for me. All these other games, they're just like, you know, superfluous to needs. But it's the Blades 
who are coming down to New Griffin Park. And who's coming down to watch the, the, the Blades is, is the Blades. It's coming down. Mark and Reggie, you hear me talking about them lots and lots on this podcast. I go to England with them. We have proper laughs all over the world. Spent time in Qatar and, you know, Brazil and all sorts of places as well. But I've also spent time in Sheffield. We went and saw them up in Sheffield just before Christmas, which wasn't the best trip for the bees on the pitch. But off the pitch, we had a brilliant time. But anyway, enough of me warbling on. I'll introduce you to Mark. Mark, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Cheers. Yeah, yeah. not bad at all. How are you yeah, doing? Yeah, I'm good, mate. You know what I'm saying? You could hear me. I'm bouncing. You know, I'm, I've got my Nashville vibe. I've got my cowboy hat on. I've got my cowboy boots on. Like, you know, I'm still uh, I'm, I'm, I'm playing my guitar. Like, you know, I'm trying to get everyone on song for Saturday because you know the bees will be singing quite hard on Saturday as you know that you know what I'm saying and uh, I don't know if the Blazers are going to be singing I mean after the Chelsea result you've got to be singing aren't you I'll tell you what it, the, the thing that was really nice about Sunday was that you actually had the stadium getting behind the team for a change I mean I think yeah Fulham as well the last couple of home games it feels like the crowd started to lose its ner- lo- lose its nervousness a little bit and start to actually enjoy being in the Premier League, which is something we haven't been able to do all season. And, you know, we haven't picked up many points. We didn't pick up many points in the last couple of games either. But at least we've been in the game. At least it's been entertaining. At least it feels like we're going and attacking. And we're, we're playing a lot better in midfield as well. So it's, it's just feeling like the season's just starting as it's as it's ending, to be honest. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, you mentioned that as well. I mean, your season, I mean, look, Sheffield United, you know, they're in the Premier League for a few seasons. Their first season was fantastic. You know, eventually they went out the Premier League, but then they went down last season. And to be quite honest with you, you properly, you know, you and Burnley properly romped it last season. You like, you just left everyone for dead and you've come into this, yeah. this league. And just, I mean, some people might be confused. What exactly has happened? Because it, it should have been this bad, should it? Well, it, it, it's been chaos from our point of view. I mean, I think most United fans knew what was coming before the season started. Uh, we ended last season. I think, you know, I I personally felt that we had a better side and a, and a better chance this time round of, of doing OK in the Premier League than we did when we went up under Wilder a couple of years back. I mean, it's it's a strange one. We We really looked like we were going somewhere at the end of last season. We had some players who felt like they had the ability to, to make a stamp on the Premier League. People like Liman and Dai, um, Sander Berg. We, we had McAtee on loan from City, who we've got back again, obviously. But um, we also had Tommy Doyle, who was great for us last season. And we we brought in some improvements around the back. Arma Hodzic, who, who looked a really good player in the Championship. We knew we had weaknesses. We, we were weak at full-back. And, you know, we've had some injuries there, which haven't helped us either. But before before the summer started, you were sort of looking and thinking, if, if we play this right, invest a bit of money and build on what we've got and get Doyle and McAtee back in one guy's rubber, you know, buy one, loan the other back. Um, it felt like we had something to build on. But no sooner, sooner the season ended than the story started going around that we only had £20 million pounds to spend, that we were unlikely to be able to get the money to buy Doyle back basically we weren't going to have enough money to invest in one player um, we might or might not get McAtee back and then the story was that Undai was possibly going then he was staying then he was going then he was staying next minute he went on the eve of the season uh, and just to, to make things worse Sanderberg followed him out the door within a couple of days and it, they were our two best players last season the two best players at the club other than Doyle and McAtee who were on loan So we kind of came into the start of the season without three of our four best players. In fact, we we were without all four of them to start the season. And then McAtee joined us on loan in what back end of the transfer window, wasn't it? So, you know, last few days. In fact, I think it was the last day of the transfer window at the end of August. So by the time the season started, I think all of us have just sat there holding our head in the hands, sort of looking and going, this is going to be a disaster. We've lost Doyle, we've lost... um, God, we've lost them die, who was the big one. I mean, he was the best young player we've had at our club for a long, long time. And, and we lost him on the eve of the season. We, we sold Berg to Burnley, which was a bit of an insult, considering they were going to be one of our chief rivals for trying to stay up. Um, and we'd bought in a few cheap transfers. I mean, you know, a few million quid for for a guy from the, the 
Swedish Premier League, which no disrespect to the Swedish Premier League, but he, he was hardly going to set the, the English Premier League alight um, and a couple of other cheap signings. And then, you know, I suppose things improved for us a little bit as the transfer window came to a close because with the money we got from selling them Dai and, and Berg, we, we brought in a couple of decent-looking signings in, in Gustavo Hamer, who's who's been... You know, not bad at all, to be fair to him. I mean, he's had a tough start, like every one of our players has had to being in the Premier League this season. But you can see his quality at times. And you can see that he was worth the money we invested in him. Um, and then Vinicius Souza, who, I mean, Joy's still out, I think, on Souza from a lot of the fans, myself included. But at least, you know, it, it was a £10 million signing and it felt like we were reinvesting in the squad a little bit. But basically, we started the season upside down is the best way of putting it we the squad that we had a chance of building on got dismantled and we we then set about trying to bring in players who had no premier league experience several of them who had no experience of english football at all and brought them in you know two weeks into the season which is is just it was asking for trouble and trouble's what we got um yeah so, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the question, interestingly, because, and, and forgive me, because maybe like, my, my Blair's history maybe isn't what it should be, but I, I thought, you know, I mean, you look at the Newcastle fans, they're like, oh, we're in the money, and they've got, you know, going around with their sort of kind of towels on their heads and all that sort of stuff that they, they got on with up there because <laughs> they got some, you know, Saudi investment. Now, I thought you got Saudi investment, and uh, uh, if I remember rightly, beforehand, you, you were all jumping up and down saying, oh, yes, we're going to be the richest club in the world, but what, what's, what's gone on? On there then. <laughs> yeah, as always, with all things played, it never is what it seems like it's going to be. And it's felt too good to be true, and it was too good to be true. And we, we got bought over by a Saudi prince, but well, well, we kind of didn't get bought over. It was a complete mess in traditional Blades fashion, really. So, way back when, it went in League One, what, four, five, six seasons ago, um, Kevin McCabe, our owner at the time, brought in this guy. He was a Saudi prince. He gave him half the club for supposedly a pound and 10 million pounds investment or something like that um and i think he thought he was a lot richer than he actually was and, and to be fair to to prince abdullah who's our owner now um I, I i don't think he's necessarily done anything untoward he's it's, it's that typical game of rich people owning football clubs you know a guy wants to get investment in his club another guy who's a rich bloke comes along and says i'd be interested in getting involved in your football club they make a deal. One assumes the other's got a lot more money than he actually has. He he, he played it cute, I suppose. Um, he wanted a football club, put his money m- money in as he was asked to. They then fell out about it all. It ended in court. Um, one was trying to buy the other out. The other was trying to buy the first one out. Everybody argued over you know, who had the right to buy who out. Um, we eventually got it sorted when we went up the first time couple of years ago under under Chris Wilder um, and the court sorted it out and decided that the Prince owned the club so he then set about paying what he was told he had to pay for the club and not being the richest Saudi Prince out there he ended up with not a huge amount of money left to invest in the in the football team so we've ended up with an owner that I think his intentions are perfectly decent I, I, I wouldn't suggest anything bad in that respect I mean others might disagree but I don't think he's a bad person and then any particular way he's just not the multi-billionaire owner that you need to be a successful premier league um club i suppose yeah. so we, we've been yeah. doing it on the cheap and getting yeah. what happens when you do it on the cheap unfortunately yes, yeah. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's some teams that are not doing it on the cheap, but they're doing it on the cheat, as they say, and they're spending yeah. far too much money and much more money than they ever should be. So at least you've got some sort of honour uh, in the Blades camp. Oh, well, hopefully we'll do. Well, well, actually, we won't talk about the points deduction anyway, but you know, we, we, we'll, we'll maybe talk about that a little bit later. But um, I'm talking about the roundabout, OK? The roundabout of Wilder. So, you know, Wilder, you loved him. You absolutely loved the Wilder. And then all of a sudden you sort of fell out of love the wild if i remember rightly and then all of a sudden somebody years later comes back to you cap in hand and says hello uh, do you forgive me can i come back and i'll I'll do a job for you you know i'll I'll, I'll, you know i'll I'll wash your dishes for you and i'll I'll, I'll mow your lawn and you all went all right then i mean what's the feeling about wild i mean you know it must be a weird one for you yeah i mean you know what i i still have a lot of time for chris wilder personally because you know 
we've had some really rubbish seasons over the years watching Sheffield United. I've, I've seen lots and lots of disappointing seasons and we had some great times in the Chris Wilder the first time round. I mean, we were languishing in League One for six, six or seven seasons and showed no signs of getting out of there. And then he came along, he gave us pride back, he, he gave passion back to the club, he brought players in, and he, really, he, he made some really astute, good signings, and got the place bouncing again. It was great. And you, I, I think it's, you know, football fans get too upset too quickly, don't they, with people? And yeah, he blotted his coffee book, he, he, he threw his toys out the pram a bit um, when we were having that terrible second season last last time round, which now doesn't seem quite as terrible compared to the terrible season this time round. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it helped him that he was in the middle of COVID and, you know, you haven't got the fans around. I think there was a lot made about us not having the fans in the ground last time. But I think, from you know, from a manager's point of view and from a player's point of view, forget, forget what difference it makes to them on the field having the fans there and, and whether that drives them forward but it must feel quite a lonely desperate sort of place when you're not winning games when you're getting beaten I mean god we didn't win a game of football till I can't even remember now but it was it was either be running towards Christmas or possibly even into the new year before we actually won a game in that second season so he was getting pretty desperate and he didn't have a lot of love around him because we were in those COVID times, everything's shut down. Um, and rightly or wrongly, he, he, he kind of decided he wanted out and I think that upset a lot of fans. Um, and then his record since then hadn't been amazing either, had it? Which I think is also a big factor. You know, I think if he'd been tearing it up at other clubs and then come back, everybody would have probably opened, um, forgiven him and, and welcomed him back and everything else. As it is, I think there's just that certain sense of, is this the answer to the problem? Um, and, you know, time will tell, won't it? But to be perfectly honest, um, I don't think it's unfair to say it, but, you know, Chris Wilder could be an absolutely fantastic manager and could be the answer to the problem, but we've got some big problems ahead as a football club. And if he doesn't do well next season, it's not necessarily down to Chris Wilder. We, we've got, what, 16, 18 players out of contract or at the end of their loan. I can't remember if it's 16 or 18, but it's one of those two. Um, it's really hard to work out what our team would be next season. Um, and we didn't spend an awful lot of money this season when we were in the Premier League, so God knows how much money we're going to have trying to build the team next season when we need, in, in theory, 15, 16 new players. Because surely a squad is a squad. They might be a lot of loans and free transfers and stuff, but yeah, you've got to be a bit of a miracle worker, haven't you, to, to turn a, a football team around after relegation when the fan fans will be muted and crowds will probably be down and you know the championship's a tough league everybody knows that it's going to be a really tough league um, and we could struggle um, I think that's the biggest fear for a lot of United fans at the moment is next season is is no gimme at all it, it's I don't think any of us know I don't think you can find a United fan that could even predict what the starting 11 would be next season I'm not even sure we'll have 11 players that we've got at the moment that will still be there for next season so it's, it's going to be a bit interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, talk about Wilder. I mean, obviously, you know, Blades have had a terrible season. Um, and But then all of a sudden, Chris Wilder reappears and we've just done the old, oh, no. Because he happened to reappear just before the match with Brentford. So it's the new, <laughs> so it's the new manager turns up. I hate to say the new manager bounced because, again, apparently there's a if you speak to the the statos you speak to you know our technical people behind there the one that do the stats and matthew benner are his people they'll say actually new manager bounce doesn't actually count because from a statistical point of view actually um there's le it, it, um, over over you know over 10 we actually find out that the new manager loses more games than he than than, than he wins actually statistically but it just sounds quite good because the new manager bounce thing but you definitely seem to have got some sort of new manager bounce on that day. And uh, that must be that your sort of first celebration for, for quite a while. I mean, what was it that, that made you win that game? Because we were just, I mean, I mean, was it the fact that you were quite good or was it the fact that we were just goddamn awful? I'd love to say it was that we were quite good. Um, yeah, you were pretty poor, to be honest. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, we, we did have a bit of a bounce. I mean, I think when you'd had the kind of horror show that we'd been having for the last few months 
a, a change of manager was always going to help. And I'd, I'd say that with the greatest respect to Paul Heckingbottom because I don't think anybody thinks this season is Paul Heckingbottom's fault. He he was thrown under the bus with what happened in the summer. He was given the impossible situation. And, you know, we, we okay, some of the level of humiliation we've suffered, um, some people are probably point at, you know, could have done a better job sort of thing. But, but the rug was firmly pulled from under his feet. And, you know, I, I think one of the things you've really seen this season um, in the Premier League is when confidence goes, it can be chaotic and disastrous. And that result against Brentford, as much as it coming down to the fact that you guys were not great on the day, you've got a lot of players out and everything else. Um, but also we had a chance to just settle the ship a little bit and get rid of all that negativity that had been building up from getting hammered week after week after week. And I imagine it, things weren't great around the dressing room in terms of confidence and everything else. And a new person comes in and maybe it, it, it's a chance to cheer up a, a dispirited bunch of players. And the bounce didn't last for long, did it? But we put in a decent performance against you by our standards that day and we actually did pretty well um, a few days later against Liverpool at home where we lost I think 2-0 uh, but by yeah. our standards this season it was a reasonably decent performance and they they never looked like bumping us which a lot of sides have looked like during this season and you would have expected yeah. Liverpool to, to take us apart a bit more than they actually did on that day so yeah. you know yeah, and the Liverpool, and the Liverpool, was, yeah and the Liverpool game is a, I think it's a couple of days beforehand actually because you played Liverpool oh, right. and you and you showed signs of uh, in fact I remember we were, we were chatting in the pub I mean great away days we said you know Sheffield we had a really good day really good pubs really good vibe you know a proper away day with you know Sheffield fans and Brentford fans in there all chatting to each other talking about football the pub was buzzing it was lively everyone even though we lost, lost went away from that game thinking what a great away day it is because to be honest you and we could probably talk about it a little bit later the, the, this Premier League malarkey a lot of the away days are are fairly average, I would say, um, compared to the to, to the to the championship away days. And I think that I'm talking about quality of fan and fan who kind of yeah. wants to talk about football and knows about football. And you go there and, and you feel kind of like you're in a football environment rather than in, in, in a sort of Hollywood movie because it's something that's been advertised on on the TV so much. Like you know, it sort of attracts all these people that are kind of there, but they're not not you know not all of them, but a lot of them are not quite the same it's, it's just just different conversations but anyway you know so that was that was quite you know quite an interesting one like i said to you there in sheffield where you got the, you know you got the result that you wanted on that day and no we weren't great um and um you said to me about the liverpool game and i was quite worried actually when you said that you know we we're looking better and i thought this is going to be so typically brentford and it was Brentford. But I mean, forget about that day because you you know a lot about the Bees. You've seen the Bees. We talk about it when we, like I said, when we go away for England about, you know, our various teams and our various players. I mean, what players are you kind of a bit nervous about for Saturday? Uh, you know what? It's I've got to say, I've kind of lost track as to who's actually in your team at the moment. You've had so many players um, out with injury. Obviously, you know, you've got the likes of Tony. Um, everybody's going to be fearing Tony, although it doesn't feel like he's quite come back. I mean, not surprisingly, he's been out for God knows how long. I suppose you're not going to hit the ground quite running in the way that he was last season. But obviously, he's quality, he's a threat. He's, he's been picked for England and played for England. and Scored for England. For England. And, and yeah, scored for England as well. Hope we don't have to come, we hope we don't have to watch him from the penalty spot. That's one definite thing because he never seems to miss, does he? But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you you know people like Witter if he's if he's available, he, he looks a neat player. Um, I'm Brian and Bumo, who else? Is... Brian and Bumo, Brian and Bumo, mate. Brian You've got to be talking about Brian. Oh yes, he's back, mate. Oh, he smashed he okay, smashed it against Villa. Me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, this is the thing is that you've had several players who, you know, you would have thought we're going to have big seasons for you who haven't been part of the team for quite a while, have you? And and it feels like you're starting to to get them all back by the sound of it. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so so, to... so so I'm just saying, so Blaze. I mean, so Blaze. I mean, you're obviously going to have to um. You, you, the combat the bees I mean what what are you because obviously you beat us in just before Christmas but 
you know, you, you've got to be confident. You know, you played Chelsea on Sunday. I mean, I, I watched it in, in Dubai. I mean, we were having a right laugh of all the Chelsea fans who were kind of giving it quite large, actually. Just like the, the Forest fans were giving it large before then, but the, the Chelsea fans were giving it large. And uh, when you scored your two goals, you know, at, at those separate moments, everybody started cheering and laughing. I think I sent you some video clips over as well of everybody sort of kind of <laughs> cheering and laughing at the Chelsea fans who, uh, again, they thought it was going to be an easy three points and it's never an easy three points. What do you yeah. think that you may be able to do against the bees that you kind of did against Chelsea? Where, where's your, where's, where, where's the fear going to come from? Where's your firepower coming from? From What's going what's gonna to strike us down? Um, the thing that will be interesting is I suppose to be fair, what team he actually puts out because he, he, we, one of our bigger problems in the last sort of month or so has been that we've got a very good looking sort of partnership between McBurney and Brereton Diaz in terms of the two of them seem to play up, play well off each other. They look like a proper front two, but neither of them seem to be fit enough to actually get on the pitch at the same time very often. So yeah, if those two turn up together, then it, they're a handful in an old-fashioned English football sort of way in that neither of them are the fastest, but they're both strong. They're both quite intelligent footballers and they both play well off each other. And so they have been causing quite a bit of trouble for some of the teams we've been up against in the last last few weeks or so. Um, you've got people like McAtee on his day. He's a good player, but he's not a guaranteed starter at the moment either because we've been shuffling things around in the field. Um, I still still like to believe that Cameron Archer's a threat if we can get him on the pitch. Again, he's been injured for God knows how long. I mean, he came back on Sunday and he came off the bench, uh, but he's been out much more than he's been in in recent times. Um, and, you know, in, in midfield, I mean, Hamer's the, the one who's, in terms of a goal-scoring threat, Hamer from midfield or McAtee. Um, Hamer almost certainly starts. McAtee may, may start make him off the bench. Um, and beyond that, 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 to be fair, I'd say they are threats. We don't seem to score a lot of goals from set pieces. We don't, we, we don't seem to be sort of like getting the centre halves on onto things and, and scoring from corners, particularly regularly with the big men coming up from the back. Uh, um, our full backs, you've got Jaden Bogle. I mean, he scored against Chelsea, didn't he? And he, he's always got a goal in him here and there, but not the biggest threat in the world. He, he's he's good on his days, Bogle. But, um, I've got, I've got to ask a question. Others. I'll ask a question while you're talking about defenders then. Um, just what's happened? Because obviously, you know, just around the corner, when, when, when I went to your place and around the corner from you, you sort of bump into him, I think, when you're doing your dog walking, you bump into John Egan, who lives not too far from you as well, don't you? The old ex Bedford yeah. player. Oh, God. Uh, I mean, this is, this is one of the things that's maybe maybe we've been lost a little bit over the course of the season is, yes, we've been poor. Yes, we deserve to get down. Yeah, you know, we've set all kinds of unwanted records this season. We've also had a hell of a lot of injuries. Um, you know, people like Egan got injured sometime in, what, September, I think it was. Basham, who was probably too old for the Premier League nowadays anyway, he obviously had a horror injury as well. Um, we've barely seen much of Bulldog this season. He's done well when he's played, but he's he's hitting that 31 sort of age and is injured more often than he's fit. Um, low on the left side of defence, our left back, um, he's barely played a handful of games maybe this season. Armour Hodgson has struggled without Egan alongside him. Um, Jack Robinson's had a good season, to be fair to him. Um, and we've had people like Aaron Trusty, um, Austin Trusty, sorry, who we brought in from Arsenal in the summer for five million quid, um, and he's been trying to trying to hold the defence together along with Armour Hodzic and Robinson, with in in a difficult situation for really. I mean, you know, his first season in the Premier League, he, he did well at, on loan at Birmingham last season, I think, in the Championship, but it's a big step up for him, and you've got an unsettled defence around him, so. You know, we, we've had all kinds of issues around the team, really, in terms of, um, you know, like up front as well. Um, people like Jebison, who looked promising at the end of last season, he's not set foot on the pitch. Um, not quite sure what the story is with him. But I, I understand he's not well, unfortunately. Um, nobody, I don't think the club's really announced what's happened to him, but he's, he's not been available all season. So that's obviously a bit worrying from, from a personal point of view, but hopefully it's, it's nothing too serious. 
Um, but, you know, Archer, who we spent 20-odd million quid on, has played a fraction of the games. Um, yeah, it, it's been one of those seasons, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. so, OK, so, listen, big game. Saturday, coming down to New Griffin Park. Uh, little do you know, you probably don't remember this, but the as you probably heard the podcast a little bit earlier, JB was giving some facts and some funk. JB comes up with all sorts. He sits there with his little machine and he just spurts them all out, facts and bunk. And I think the last time that we actually beat Sheffield United was that time when you came down uh, when we were in the third tier. And remember, I went camping with the kids. I went camping in like, you know, in Staines or Raysbury or something or wherever, wherever, out, out that way, you know. And uh, and I came in on the train and I went camping and we met you and, I, and we beat you 3-1 with uh, with my, with my old mate Grig scored a goal as well. I don't, I don't know if you remember that one, do you? Yeah, I, I think I do remember that one, to be perfectly honest. I remember you guys going off camping and I remember, I didn't remember it was 3-1, but I seem to remember it was a pretty miserable day from our point of view. That's right, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a strange one, isn't it, really? Because despite the fact that over the last few years, you have flown and we have kind of wobbled a lot and not been anything like as successful as you guys have been in recent years, um, yeah, we've not had a bad head-to-head -head record against you, which makes me start to feel like maybe this weekend is the time that you get one over on us again. Unfortunately, um, I mean, but, but it's one of those, isn't it, at the moment? Because to be fair, we, I long since gave up on what could happen for us this season. All, it's all about not conceding six, seven, eight, or nine. Um, so, you know, if we concede three points on Saturday, if we put up a damn good performance and it's an exciting game, I take, I take that over a drab, disappointing game or an absolute hammering. It's it's kind of one of those. But don't get us wrong, we're coming down and we're hoping we're going to win and we're hoping we're going to keep our our little run going against you. And, you know, as long as it doesn't send you lot down um, and as long as we can have a nice day, that would be a nice change this season because, yeah, we haven't had many, many good weekends, to be perfectly honest. Um <laughs> No. And oh, right, right. out with the bees is always fun. So it'd be nice to have a game where we all enjoy it and we all have a nice day and no one's too disappointed afterwards. I mean, hopefully, <laughs> be fair. I don't think either of us have got too much to play for now this season. I know you're still slightly under threat, but I can't really see it being a problem. I can't really see you going down, if I'm honest. And it, it'd take an absolute miracle and a hell of a lot of points deductions for us to have a chance of staying up. So I don't think we need to worry about it from a can, mm -hmm. we, can we do an an amazing escape sort of scenario. I think that's long since gone, unfortunately. Yeah, no, okay. I mean, and, and what I'll say also is obviously, you know, if, if we, if you beat us tomorrow, it just makes things a little bit spicier. That's all I'll say because I think everyone's banked on the fact we're going to get three points against you. And if we don't, and if Luton or something like that win, which they've not expected to do them, or not in the forest as well, then it just, it just makes things a little bit tighter in that zone. Um, and also, I will also say to you is that, you know, at the end of the day, is that we don't mind if you uh, uh, give us a six nil hammering, okay, and then you can go and beat somebody else next week, which is fine, and you can enjoy that one instead so uh so i'm going to ask you to give a score prediction oh god i hadn't even thought about it if i'm dead honest but yeah. um I'd, thinking. I'd say probably maybe there two you one to you um Ooh, i'd, I'd like to think maybe we can yeah i mean oh. I, I think we i think we can get ourselves a goal we've been looking more threatening more recently and we have been at least getting a goal again. We managed to get a goal at Liverpool, and we, to be fair, we deserved that goal at Liverpool as well. I mean, don't get us wrong, they deserve to beat us. They have 83% possession, but you could kind of see it coming. We were we were getting forward with, with purpose at times, and it wasn't a massive surprise when we actually did manage to get ourselves a goal. So I'd back us to get a goal. I just, our defence always worries me, and, and two is maybe. I think from my point of view, I'm just hoping we don't have one of our calamitous defence days because the thing that's been most disappointing from a player's point of view this season, amongst a lot of disappointing things, is that we have this look about us sometimes where when we concede one, we could concede three in the next 10 minutes and often quite regularly do. So cutting that out of our game and being able to come and have a nice day and an exciting game that maybe gets decided either way late on would be would be fun, and I'll go for two one for you. But I hope I'm wrong. 
There you go, 2-1 to us. And by the sounds of it, with both our defences, you know, our absolute makeshift defence that seems to be letting in goals for fun. And yours, there's some goals for fun. I mean, I'm going to do my prediction later with Laney, but maybe, but maybe I should go for 7-6 instead of, <laughs> instead of what I go for later because it, it sounds like it's going to be one of those type of games. I hope not. Or in a way, I hope, I hope it is as long as we win. But anyway, listen, well, Mark, it's been absolutely brilliant chatting to you. I'm very much looking forward to you seeing you on Saturday morning, very early for breakfast. We're doing a bit of breakfast over, I don't know, Q or Q by the river on the green or might go to Richmond or something like that. But we're starting very early. I know you're very scared because you're not used to these early starts, are you? Not used to these early I, starts. I'm, it's not so much the early starts. It's just I know how good you are at having an all-day sesh, Bill. So that, that kind of worries me more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. We, we, we got, listen, I've got, I've got them worried. I've got the Blades fans worried. We just need to get the Blades team worried now. And we're all sorted. Yeah. Mark, good catching up with you. And I'll see you on Saturday. Yeah, look forward to it, mate. Take care. There you go, Mark the Blade, and uh, he's pretty. Yeah, you know, he's pretty relaxed to be quite honest with you. I mean, obviously they haven't had the best season in the world, and he's got used to it. And uh, the most dangerous thing, I suppose, for us is just probably like his attitude, is his team's attitude. They just think, well, we've got nothing to lose, and uh, you know, we just pick up whatever points we can, and you know, maybe Brentford are a beatable game, and uh, we can actually go and beat them. So let's just go off and do it. And there's absolutely no one expects anything. Um, of them at all and I suppose that's going to be the biggest danger for us and the biggest danger for for the Brentford team so we need to be 100 we've said this before lady but we need to be 100% on our guard don't we and we need to be 100% on point and like I said to you beforehand us fans need to be on point we need to be going there we need to be from day one even beforehand you know when we used to when we played Bournemouth in the um, in the playoff semi-final literally we're half an hour beforehand we were like singing the roofs off off the stadium but we need to be giving it loads of that in this game on Saturday because this is a massive game yeah uh, you, know, I'll, uh, you know I'm not going to repeat myself for the third time but yeah it, it, it is it's incredible it's it's the biggest game of our season um, and it, it you know it, it, it's some it's a game that I, I we have to win this one you know a, a point out of this I, I, I you know I don't think is is acceptable um, acceptable is probably the wrong word, but it, I, I think we, we we have to be winning this. You know, if we if we are a Premiership football club for next season, we have to be able to find a way of beating Sheffield United at home on Saturday. And that's not to, I'm not do, I'm not I'm not having a snide dig at Sheffield United, but they've they've proved that they're not strong enough to be in the Premier League this season. We have to prove that we are capable and we are good enough to be in the Premier League. We didn't prove that yeah. up at their place. We have to we have to resurrect that on on Saturday, and 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 the, and the resurrection. I mean, again, you, you're looking at you're looking at pretty much the same team again, um, Laney. You know, I mean, you talk about Tony starting, but everybody else, you're looking at the same team. Um, I, I'm not. No, I, 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 I'm not. So I'm not so sure. Damsgaard gets gets another start. Um, you know, he did nothing wrong necessarily, but um, you know, I I, I thought. Um, Yarmouk may may come in again, um, but you know Dam's got has got more experience. But I think um, Yarmouk's kind of got is, is slightly more direct. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't I don't see massive changes. I, I think there will be some. Um, I, I depends if you know Pinnock might make a, a, rem, a remarkable return. You know, I, I, maybe this is not the game for him, but he's you know he's not too far away. Hopefully. Um, so yeah, and we need him, uh, and, we, and we need him with those aerial balls, don't we? Yeah, massively. You know, yeah. he's, he's so he's so invincible in the air at times. You know, and he's, he's just a huge mess. So yeah, I mean, I think you know, Regulon, Regulon, assuming that he's not injured, he's, he's, he starts again. But KLP can fit in. But I think I think we're at I think we're at our strongest when you've got a specialist left back there rather than a you know someone that's filling in. But um, we need pace and we need width and we need to get at them and we need to create loads of chances. Um, and right. I think you do you do that you do that with Brian and Tony in the team. And strengths and weaknesses. Sheffield United strengths stealing the ball from the opposition. So obviously, sort of quite aggressive um, is the way that they play. Um, but their weaknesses 
finishing scoring chances, avoiding individual errors, defending set pieces, avoiding fouling in dangerous areas, protecting the lead, very weak at keeping possession of the ball, very weak at defending against attacks down the wings, very weak at defending against long shots, very weak against defending against skillful players. So there's loads there that we can get our teeth into. We just need to make sure that we just don't get into a lull of, of a, a false sense of security, really. Yeah, and they're not going to come here to try and be clever and do low blocks and you know try and sneak. They're, they're, I, I, it's, it's it's all over for them unless they actually you know they 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 go and win this game of football um, by scoring more goals than us. And I I think there's going to be goals in this, but they've they've shown that in in the recent weeks they can they can they can they they just don't give up. You know we 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 can look at the Newcastle game, we can look at the Arsenal game, we can look at the Brighton game. You know that they they hemorrhaging goals uh, at, at that stage of the season. They seem to have have got through that. But you hit them with the right deliveries, you hit them with the right intensity, they crack. So we have to just make sure it's a man night performance, it's not a Brighton performance. Right, definitely. So listen, Laney, give us a score prediction. Very edgy 3-1 victory. Oh, 3-1 victory to the mighty, mighty bees. I'm gonna go for uh, I'm gonna go for a 4-2 victory to the bees as well. Uh, which is all good. So, uh, to, so listen, I mean, it could be a big game, like I said, to you, a big game on Saturday. I, t- I, t- I just want to just recall one final story because, you know, the way that we've been playing, we're converting people all around the world. And, you know, like, hopefully, like I said to you, we're going to get a result on Saturday. We'll be able to stay up and then we'll more people around the world will see us and we can go to wherever we need to next year, probably Chicago, where the, ne- the next fan fest is going to be just for a bit of a laugh of the weekend. But um, it's quite funny because there was this character, right? And uh, he was a Nashville, he was actually a Nashville, but not my make Kevin the Nashville B, but another Nashville B. And he'd uh brought in Brentford and uh I saw him with a Brentford shirt on, he's chatting to me, he goes, Hey Billy, how you doing? So I had a good old conversation with him. Anyway, I was chatting to Paul Buckle and Gary Blisser and, and, and Marcus Gale by one of the stands and this guy comes over and uh he's wearing a Crystal Palace shirt. And I seen him and he's like chatting to me and I was going, so I'm a bit confused because I'm I'm sure I saw you in a Brentford shirt earlier. And he was like going, oh, yeah, 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 the Brentford shirt on earlier. I said, you know, I said, mate, mate, no, no, that's a that's a number. You can't be doing that. You can't be wearing a Crystal Palace shirt, mate. If you're Brentford, you're Brentford through and through. And it's really hilarious. I've got the camera out. I've got a video. I may send it to you later. The literally, the guy goes, hold on a second. And he literally ripped off the Crystal Palace shirt. And he had a Brentford shirt underneath. He threw it on the floor, stamped on it. He goes, I'm never going to wear it again. And I just thought, hilarious. Those kind of things that you'll see from different characters around the world, but it also goes you shows you the power of the bees, the power of Brentford, and uh, and the power of well football as it goes. You know what I'm saying? So that's I don't the know power why I told you that story. Power, power of you, by the sounds of it. So you scared the scared the fucking life out of him. By the sounds of it. <laughs> that's hilarious, <laughs> like you know. But yeah, he's, it's just seeing him rip off the shirt and just throwing it on the floor, and I just thought that's good, that's good. He, and then he said, "I'll never wear it again," and I thought that's exactly what we want to hear so i think he's been converted as well so that's it job's been done slowly one by one lady but anyway listen this is all good shout out to us got to give a shout to paul buckle again for taking care of us and rebecca and this little boy teddy as well which is all good shout also going out to the nashville b and ben as well gave us a great time i said to you in nashville and also like i said reggie the tallahassee b as well and michelle was out there he was in the globe um the previous saturday it was so mad seeing him in the globe one saturday then i see him in nashville the following week so uh, like i said to you loads of bees out there it's good to see you all out there the brentford posse in america getting stronger and stronger but hey, laney this is besotted pride of west london podcast i'm trying to i'm just trying to get us on an up vibe trying to get us kind of really vibes up for this game on saturday it's going to be really nerve-wracking uh it's going to be my first probably real nervous game since for, for, for quite a while to be quite honest with you so uh i think for all beast fans as well like i said just go out and enjoy yourself and make sure we get behind the team on saturday my name's billy Grant, and i'm sitting here in the virtual joint with my maiden lady good afternoon Good afternoon to you too. Like I said, you get down to New Griffin Park, get down to Brentford area very early, go down there, get your mates. As you say, Gallo, you bees. Gallo, you bees. Gallo, you bees. Let's play Gallo, you bees. Gallo, you bees. Let's blunt them blades. Blunt them all over. You bees. Gallo, you bees.